related to IP strategies for startup companies. Now, as we all know, the backbone of every economy is small, medium, or if you're from India, it's the micro, small, and medium entities, you know, which constitute something like 85%, I think, or uh, something like that of all the companies. Although we hear only about the Fortune Next in, in the news, but all of the SMEs get clubbed into this 85%, 95% as a statistic, but that's where the big, you know, the industry lies. That's where the economy lies. That's where most of the jobs lie. And, and uh, uh, you know, a couple of presentations yesterday were also targeted and uh, pointed out by uh, speakers about um, how an economy, how many billions and uh, millions of dollars have been generated based on the IP through startups. So startups form, you know, the basis for a lot of these uh, small economies, small businesses, and and part of their, uh, you know, monetization or business and revenue generation is to have a proper IP strategy. The absence of a proper IP strategy for the startup will basically mean that they go out of business pretty quickly. <laughs> or they get swallowed by some of the bigger companies if they don't have uh, a right attitude, right strategy for a vision for themselves. So to discuss some of these uh, aspects and more, we have the next set of panel led by the moderator Randa Habi by, she here today? Oh, sorry. And I'd invite Dr. Lawrence Kaiser, Karim Inhali and uh, Anand. <coughs> to take up your positions on the stage and kickstart this whole proceeding. Thank you all. Thank you. Production. And uh, thank you all for uh, sticking with us uh, on the second day. Uh, how is the energy level? I hope it's high because we have uh, three inspiring uh, speakers with us who will cover uh, startup uh, strategies from uh, several aspects from different angles. So we're keeping the best for the last and uh, stick with us and prepare your questions for the last round. So I will start by uh, introducing my uh, team panelists. We have first with us uh, Dr. Lawrence Kaiser, who is the senior legal counsel in uh, GE Germany. Uh, specializing in R&D contra contracts and IP rights with a strong focus on IP management. Uh, he's engaging in uh, German and European expert groups for R&D cooperation and IP management as well as trainings. Uh, next we have with us uh, Mr. Karim El Helali, uh, uh, Group Head of Legal at PCCW uh, Media, who are the owners of uh, ViewClip. Um, Mr. Karim is attorney at law with 25 plus years of experience, and he's passionate about tech law, media, telecommunication, and fintech. Uh, last but not least, we have with us uh, Anand, who is the, the founder, or he's the uh, company secretary, and uh, he's the founder of uh, Let's Learn uh, Law and Easy Drafting. Uh, finally, if you allow me to, to introduce myself, uh, I started my career at uh, Saba & Co. Intellectual Property, and after 15 years in uh, food regulation in regulatory affairs in the food industry, I set up uh, regulatory affairs planning insights and developments to look after uh, food regulation in terms of uh, compliance and uh, labeling. Thank you all for being here with us. And uh, we start the panel with uh, Dr. Lawrence from the very basic and to start by introducing what are the key aspects of a startup and a successful one? How do you define it? Yes, this is a good question. Um, um, because uh, there are many factors leading to a successful uh, spin-off and you cannot compare the one with the other. The usual situation you have, you can see on this uh, picture when a person or a group wants to spin, uh, to, to start up with a company, uh, then they have a, an idea or a patent or whatsoever. And when they, and what you need nowadays for, uh, for such a company is 
money, capital, and, uh, um, and, and partners. And there are several, um, let's say, uh, elements you have to fulfill. And you, you see on the next slide, you can, you can summarize there. And one of each is, uh, of this is also IP, the topic of this, of this event, but it's not at all the first of all. I think the most important in my experience, and I had the honor to build up a venture group in Fraunhofer during my uh, business experience, was that the most important uh, aspect is the team, the person, the management. It must be a market-oriented management, otherwise it doesn't work. This is first. And please forgive me the term spin-off. I had so many spin-offs, which is for me a special kind of a start-up. Um, uh, but the uh, factors are the same. And the second, I would say, after the, after the good team, the, the success-oriented team, would be a clear IP situation. And uh, don't, um, uh, um, don't think, please, that always a patent is something that leads to a success. Most of the startup companies do not start with a patent. They would like to have one. And they are lucky when they have one. But the patent as such is nothing if you have not the environment around, if you have not the specialist for it, and so on and so forth. Now, let's see a clear IP situation. And then the third is a partnership, because products and services of, us, of, of today are not a product of one person. Uh, it's a, a result of cooperation, and you need sustainable partnerships, long-term partnerships, which lead you to a success then. And uh, also, uh, very important is the money. You need more money than ever expected. It will always, always be not enough, uh, because the many startups are beginning in a seed phase, you know what it means. The product is not really there. It is visible, but it is a vision, and you have to create, and there you need money and uh, experience and partnership. So I would say number four is win-win situation uh, for spin-off in investors. And then you must see the market. Uh, the markets are also different. Some market or some companies see in the startup a com an, an, an competitor. And often, this is not an exception, it often happens, they either buy it or they kill it before it becomes to a success. Therefore, you have to see the demand of the market. What does the market, re does it really need what I am offering then? And when is it needed? And how is it needed? And Therefore, the shareholder situation is also important. If you have a, a company that maybe will take over you, uh, you and uh, the valuation, this is the last point. I think I'm exceeding my time. Um, when you come to the bank or uh, as, a, as a startup or to an in, uh, investor, he asks, what is your IP? What is it? And then you have a, I, he has to value in a sense, your IP. And what is the value of IP? What is the value of a patent? Nobody can say this, and this is a problem all over the world, the valuation of uh, such things. Um, you must find a way to show effectively how this new product, new service will influence the market. That's the most important. And then uh, they do it. A lively example I can tell you, and then I stop, sorry, Randa. Um, I am taking care for, an, uh, for a spin-off in, uh, in Munich, in, no, it's Würzburg, it's north of Munich, uh, in the moment, which is really lively, which is now in the start-up position. It's a spin-off of, uh, of a Fraunhofer Institute, and he has not the idea, but the concrete technology of battery reclaim. Um, you can imagine that this is a market, an extreme market. And uh, the first that he uh, did to, to find the concept was to acquire for funding from the government. He received immediately a lot of money to define this, to, to, to make the, the business plan. Business plan is extremely important. 
And now uh, he asked uh, automotive company to whether they are interested in, in, in reclaiming of batteries. They were absolutely on and it, it didn't took four weeks. Then he had an order of a high uh, sum to do that. There he has, he has met the market. You can imagine what it means when we have more electronic cars and what the batteries are over and have to be reclaimed and can be reclaimed. I am looking forward to, to work with him. I'm advising him and I wish him the best. This is concrete something in an ideal situation. Thank you, doctor. That was really insightful. And now moving on to, to Karim. We would like to know your personal experience with, uh, with the startups and uh, in general the, the fields of uh, tech and media, which you're passionate about. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, thank you, Lawrence, for all these insights as well. Well, let's just go to back to basics for a second, okay? And, you know, since we're all here, it's an IPR conference, so we're talking about IP, startup, technology, fintech, etc., AI particularly. So if we can go back, uh, you know, a little bit and differentiate between what is IP and what is IPR, okay? So there's the intellectual property, which is the properties of the mind, and then you have the intellectual property rights. For example, you have an invention. That's an IP. An invention need to go through phases and stages to become an IPR, which is a patent. Okay? So this is a very important step because a company can have IP and they don't do anything about it. They just keep it there and it becomes a liability later on. They don't know how to commercialize it, how to capitalize on it, how to move to the next stage. And a lot of startup we've seen, they crash too early either because they spend too much or they don't know what to do with their technology stack. So that's very important. Now, AI, okay? So AI didn't come out from a vacuum, okay? AI is a very, is a product of something. Is a product of what? It's a product of data. So what is data, okay? So our data, there are two types of data. There is data in general, which is names, identities, personal information, you know, all data. Everything is data, basically. Uh, there's a very interesting definition in uh, Merriam-Webster for data. I urge you to go back and check what is data. Now it evolved. And then there are data assets, which is the buzz around. How can you uh, make your data or transform your data from a raw data into an asset where you can monetize it, where you can commercialize it, where you can make money out of it? So, in general, in data, there are 10 domains of data. There is data architecture, data integration, data warehouse, data storage, data security, uh, which comes underneath it, privacy. And then you have big data. And under big data, there are two things, okay? Machine learning and AI. AI is what is called in the data science is like predictive, you know, uh, analysis where you have machine learning is prescriptive. So, you know, and this is very important because we keep talking about AI, AI, chat, GPT. We need to know exactly where it comes from. It didn't come from a vacuum, okay? And in order to have a successful AI, you have to have a successful data asset. You need to have a proper management of data. So you can't have the data architect working in silo and you have the data quality engineer working inside. There must be a collaboration between both. I'm a lawyer. What threw me into data? What made me study data? And we are in the age of storytelling. So as, as you all know, you're sitting in your uh, office and one of the sales come and say, oh, one of my customers want to extend the warranty or they want to change something in their presentation or the guarantee. So I used to get lost and, and keep asking the IT and the IT say something and then someone come from the top of the management say something else. So I said, you know what? I want to be stopped depending on IT for a change. I want to understand what's going on. So when I specialized in data, I understood that to extend just the warranty of a product, you need to consult three main people, the enterprise data architect, who has a full vision of the business strategy of the company. You need to consult with 
the solution architect who knows exactly the impact of any change in the product. And then you need to consult with the application architect who is specialized in that particular product. Without consulting of the three of them and having a full alignment, your advice could put the company in a huge risk because you could extend the warranty while the company has no plan to continue with this product and they were willing to discontinue it. And then all of a sudden you find yourself liable to your customer. So this is why I wanted to specialize in data a bit early in time to understand, to stop being dependent on people. So when internal customers like sales or product managers come and ask, you give a solid advice based on something. Now, startup, like Lauren said, they tend to, you know, spend too much. I, I, I usually have this description of startup as like they're teenagers. <laughs> they want to do everything so quickly. They want to do everything and they want to get the best profits and they forget a lot of stuff. One of the main important thing is the IP. You could have a very good technology stack, but you don't know what to do with it. Okay? You could be infringing on somebody else and those companies are waiting for you to generate profits to come and stop you and claim all the money that you've made. So if there's no strong collaboration internally on how the IP should be filed, yes, it is expensive, but there's so many ways to get around the expensive IP. You don't have to file a patent. You can keep it as a trade secret. There is a new thing called the I stuff, which is all the non-tangibles other than the IP, the codified know-how, the network, the connection, okay, uh, your library, your, you know, there's so many things that doesn't have to be a patent or a trade secret in order to be an intangible IP, but uh, intangible, and they call it now the I stuff, the all the non-intangibles, intangible that are not IP, and the company can start building from there, because to give you an example, to maintain a patent globally, worldwide, it costs one hundred thousand dollar per year, just to maintain it globally, okay? So I don't think a startup would even consider that cost in order to file for a patent. So there are so many alternatives to protect your IP or create your IP as a startup. Thank you. Thank you, Karim. Uh, if I may add, I totally relate to the last bit that you shared as a startup with the fast pace that the whole business is progressing through. It might be uh, challenging and also due to the limited resources in terms of uh, time, human resources, and financials, that it can be skipped. So the least we can do is to, to quantify it and identify it very well, uh, invest in the team and update them on all the, the details, and keep track when the resources are there to make sure it's treated as a priority. So moving on to Anand, um, uh, we will talk about the learnings later, but I want to ask you as a company secretary and lawyer, what was the trigger uh, behind the, the two startups that you launched? And how did you define or identify the, the competitive edge? Yeah, thank you, Randa. Thank you, Kareem and Lawrence for your inputs. And uh, uh, I would like to say that a startup uh, is, a, is a coined word and uh, Whenever you hear that a startup means uh, I myself have two startups and I work very closely uh, uh, with the startups and advise them. So whenever we interact with them, so we saw that they have some product, they have some idea, but they don't know how to uh, manage that, how they will get that idea into implementation and how that idea will work. So that is the uh, mere challenge and most part that what is the legality part of that how to protect that idea so uh, individual when it, it it might be he might be in some any industry across either automobiles technology agriculture anyone education you can take so the most uh, triggering point is that that how to protect that IP and believe me initially if you tell any startup that uh, uh, before going on in the market, you have to protect your uh, IP. So the most important thing that the in any startup counter 
is the cost associated with this because the cost of the ip if it if it is any invention then patents so that is not uh, uh, very easy to get and it is time consuming and costly too but uh, as an advisor uh, uh, we we used to see the ecosystem in which the startup is working so when i started my uh, startup by the name let's learn law so there were many people working on this idea but what the other people lack were the consistency many came up and gone we also started during the covid because everyone has uh, their uh, part to share to the uh, internet sitting at home everyone was uh, going abroad uh, with their ideas with their videos with webinars and many things happened but as the time changes and gradually we came uh, again the uh, everything normalized so uh, at that point of time the, those startup grow up they could not survive for the long because they they have imitated to uh, some of the known brands so most most of them has some idea either uh, domestically or from some international companies or ideas which are already prevailing so the genuinity always lacks so at that point of time they start but growing onwards they face the litigation part of that so that at that point of time it is very much uh, difficult to grow with your uh, idea because the company who is who is uh, let you in the litigation is a stronghold company and for a startup to face that litigation is very difficult what about the the metaverse and the gamification bit of it uh, metaverse i discussed in detail yesterday that uh, uh, we are uh, that is all together a new world a world beyond the universe that is the virtual world then no physical presence of anyone would be required that is a 3d immersive world everyone has their own avatar and everyone will uh, will going there and there also we uh, yesterday we uh, talked in detail about the how uh, the ip rights would be tackled there so the challenges either with the startup or either the metaverse is how to tackle the ip either that is not the first priority point to discuss uh, when we because startups are busy that i uh, this is my market this will be my consumers these are the legal implications so they forget about protecting their ip so but when they gradually grow this is the most challenging part they have to face thank you thank you anand now we move to the second round of questions and this one is addressed to all of you in your uh, uh, perspective uh, way so uh, if you mind maybe you can continue the questions in the end thank you so uh, in your own uh, respective field, uh, what are the, the key learnings in your own uh, IP journey? And how would you prioritize or treat IP differently in, in startups that you were with or you've, you've seen or worked with closely? We start with Karim. A key uh, point is for lawyers, IP lawyers, the, you have to be more involved with the business, with the product team. You have to really understand. You have to step out of your comfort zone, which is your office, or only receiving. You need to get more understanding of the technology. How is it done? You have to do a lot of market research to make sure that your company is not infringing, you know, is not bypassing. Uh, you also have to do a lot of research and step out and be ahead of your business uh, team and see if, it, if this IP can be commercialized. Because at the end of the day, like Anand said, you can have an IP, but it's worthless. You know, you need to see if you can commercialize by licensing, by license in, license out, cross license. Uh, the valuation that Lawrence touched on is critical, okay? There are <clears throat> so many uh, models for technology valuation or IP valuation. You have the discounted cash flow, you have the market share, you have the, you know, the, the, the so many models. But again, depending on your industry and your company particularly, your valuation will have a huge impact. One of the most important thing is to, like you said, it's costly to file for a patent. It's costly to file for a trademark. 
it's confusing where to file, okay? And you need to really groom. There's something called the IP portfolio grooming phase, where you separate the core from the non-core IP. What do you need, what you don't need. If you don't need something, maybe you can license it out. If you need something, you need to make sure that it's properly drafted. <clears throat> Everything has to be. So there's a lot on the IP lawyer to do for a startup. Observation of the regulatory regime. Shall I file in the UAE? Shall I file in Egypt? Shall I file in Europe? What is the best way to file in Europe? Etc. So there's a lot of consideration. Unfortunately, the burden on an IP lawyer in a startup is 10 times the burden in a normal uh, company. I hope that answers your question. Yes. Uh, Anand, do you have any build on this? Yeah, I will just give a uh, very short answer to this. A practical example, one of my clients who is in a healthcare industry is a startup. In 2017, we started advising him. He got the startup registration and all. And uh, he has a trademark uh, in which a plus sign was there with a red mark, with a red color. So initially when we are going for the trademark, so I said Ki, this will not hold because it resembles to some organization. So he said, you know, I want to go ahead with this, just file, okay? Okay, we go ahead with that and we file. And recently we received objection from Red Cross Society. So <laughs> now he said, what to do? Surprisingly. So, uh, now he said, what to do? I can sit back and relax. <laughs> Dr. Lawrence? Uh, yes, uh, I will try it from, from the other end. What be, would be the best uh, startup? The best startup would produce a mass product and will work on low tech, not high tech, because high tech you can make a lot of mistakes and you need a lot of IP and you have a lot of uh, you, uh, maybe problem with litigation. I, will, I like examples, so I give you a living example again. There was a startup, it was an Austrian, it cooperated with the Fraunhofer Institute, it was about um, a motion sensor, the, the, the company was called Sensor Dynamics. In the beginning, there was nothing than a research result. The research result, how to develop and produce a motion sensor, mass product. Every car all over the world needs motion sensor. This was a so-called sixth of motion sensor, sixth direction of vehicles all around. But when it, but this is not low tech, this is high tech to develop this. And it was also, they had a patent about it, the, the startup. But when you have such a situation, then you need a high TRRL, technological readiness index. You know that, what it is, level, sorry, not in the level. It about seven to eight, that you can see the product. If you start with two, if you start with a, with a lab uh, a result and uh, a, a patent, you need so much time and so much money, this is not good for a startup. But this, to make a long story short, they developed it to an end. And what was motion sensor before also existed in all cars. But this one he developed, this startup developed, was 10 times cheaper than the usual marketable one. But why it was cheaper? Because the development was clever and he did not patent it in the start, in the beginning, visible for all. He did it step by step and then it became ready for the market. And then he did not start, uh, or he did start with two or three key players on that field. And then with that he became famous and after it, this company was sold for a high million uh, value. It were eight figures, I think. Well, it was really good business. And this started from one lab result with one IP, but it had to develop. It comes not from anywhere falling down the sky. You have to work very diligent with very good partners on it. So if I understand correctly, the learning here is to invest in pre-work or groundwork to make it as simple as possible, even from a technology perspective. Correct? That's it, that's, okay. it. that's it. And then don't make things possible too difficult. 
if you have a high-tech solution, you have to start in the seed in a very, very low phase. And this takes too long for a startup. This is a question of cooperating partners to come. And, and if, if the, the result is done, if you can go to the market, maybe your startup is never existing. So straight on, if it's low tech, if it's high tech, you need partners. That's a good story and good learning. So now we move to the third round of questions to, to all of you as well. Uh, as you know, the UAE here has a vibrant uh, startup uh, IT landscape. So uh, we would like to know about your experience here and also feel free to comment on the regulatory, uh, sorry, the IT landscape in your respective markets. We have a diverse group here. So India, Egypt, and Germany. Please feel free to contribute. We'll start with Anand. Okay. Uh... The startup ecosystem, first I will start, uh, I will, uh, since I am from India, so India is known, uh, today it is now known as a land of a startups and land of entrepreneurs. Why? Because the startup journey of India is very fascinating and it is not very old. In just last uh, uh, government of India started a, a startup program, a startup India on 16th January 2016 and at, on that day, we had odd 452 startups registered with the government. And uh, as of now, uh, we are uh, around 100,000 startups registered with India. And uh, uh, India is uh, uh, third highest in the number, in the number of unicorns. And uh, second, uh, India is in second in the number across, across the globe in number of startups and uh, number one across the globe in a starting a startup adding adding up every day so in 2021 india added one unicorn in every 29 days and it reduced to nine days in 2022 so this is how a startup journey of india is going and it is just the uh, government say it is just the beginning why it is happening i would say because the government of India under the startup scheme is providing so much facilities to the startups. They have numerous programs, especially for these startups. If you uh, want to file your trademark, you will have the 50% reduction in your fees. If you have the uh, file the patents, you will, you will have 80% reduction in your fees. And uh, uh, with a startup registration, you get three years tax exemption. So these are kind of, and also for the foreign startups, uh, government has many program, SIP, EIP, support for international patents in electronics and IT. Uh, government provide grants up, uh, up to uh, you know, 500,000 or, or uh, uh, 200,000 for foreign uh, trademarks and patents. So there is a complete ecosystem. There are incubators, funding organizations, everything under one roof. Just you have to get yourself registered under a startup and government is there to provide across the private institutions, private bodies who are working. The government is providing extremely everything to the startups. You just have to get your startup registered in India. Thank you. That's really impressive. Karim, would you like to add? Um, yes, for, for the region, uh, GCC, Middle East in general, <clears throat> there are two parts. There are like the IP laws, and then there's the technology law or the data law. So the IP laws, if, if you look at all of the laws in the region, you'll find them all dated 2002, whether here or in Egypt or Kuwait, Bahrain. And the reason be, just to give a background, because uh, the countries here, they had a, a deadline as per the TRIPS or a WTO member state uh, that they all have to issue IP laws by 2002. Those IP laws, which is the infrastructure for innovation, supposedly, have not been updated since 2002, okay? And then the digital transformation era came in 2012, 2014 with the cloud, you know, all that stuff. And then we've seen a lot of laws regarding technology that are scattered everywhere. You have data privacy law, you have virtual asset law, you have the fintech law, you, have, you know. But the good news 
<clears throat> is that government are trying to cope as much as possible and they are quite fast. So you find the central bank in all of these countries are issuing laws that regulates fintech. You find the free zones here are issuing laws to cope with data privacy. Uh, to be honest, the UAE and Saudi are you know, very much advanced. Um, and when you're doing, and this is from experience, when you're doing a data governance program for any company, you have to do what is called a capability buildup. And for a capability built up, you need to have all the relevant laws in place. Data, FinTech, IP, consumer protection, all the stuff that get to touch on the technology and the innovation. Luckily, this is all here in place, okay? Uh, there is so much appetite on both, okay? Government and private to cope and get to there. So. Uh, there are a lot of incentives in Egypt or in the UAE for startup in the tech space. There are a lot of fundings available, are a lot of facilities. Uh, there are not a lot of stringent rules for setting up or getting license or adding activity, etc. So there is a complete understanding that this is the present and the future. There is a full support from government all around the region to make sure that the legal infrastructure or environment is in place to cope because the, they've learned from previous experience, you know. So it is comforting. Uh, there's a lot of pressure on the companies itself to comply, okay. I think for the first time here, I mean, uh, we see the governments are very uh, proactive, you know, uh, and the companies are trying to catch up, <laughs> to be honest. Thank you. Interesting. Any build from Germany side? Uh, yes, um, uh, let me answer like this. It's developing slowly. Uh, let me come shortly to the mentality of us Germans. I must say this, uh, sorry. We are very diligent, we are very eager. You know, German quality products have their uh, have a wonderful uh, reputation, but I must confess we are not the fastest. And uh, in comparison to Asian people, I would compare us with a lame duck you can see that most of the inventions, technological, and, uh, are from Germany, from German inventors. The valuation, the monetization is in Asia. Why? Because we are too slowly. And the same was the development of, the, uh, of, a, of a startup strategy. Now we know it again. And when the German train is running, then you can never stop it. It started about 2000 then there were programs to fund in the seed phase it, 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 too slowly too slowly now 20 years after uh, the venture capitalists are coming and financing and doing something and it, uh, uh, it it's too slowly we have we have now uh, several programs but in my impression um, it's again not fast enough I have again one example for you, which I, it's wonderful, an Indian example. We had once an invention in Fraunhofer, which should lead to a startup that was about a surface on the roof of cars, you can imagine, with photovoltaic elements, which would collect energy from the sun and, um, uh, and, and uh, driving an air condition of the car. So you park your car in the middle of the sun, Sun is burning on the roof and inside it becomes cool. Isn't that nice? That was wonderful. Finally, it did not work. Why? Not the technique was bad. It was excellent. It was a, a, a really good. But it was the critical mass. The, the, this roof is too small and the photovoltaic elements are, too le are less to, to make that cool. And then this ended. This was not, was not pursued anymore. And then there came an Indian company and said, why is this lost? This is not lost. Why do you license this technology to us? And do you know, it, this company is called VM Solar. You can look it up in the internet. What they did, they did when the critical mass on a car roof is too small, then we need a larger one. Where is a larger one for photovoltaics is our market halls. And now in India, all the market halls are covered with the technology of, uh, of, the, uh, of, the, 
originally planned car layer uh, on the roof. This is, um, uh, let's say, um, uh, creative in a sense. And uh, this is an extremely successful uh, startup now. And that says, in my opinion, everything. Uh, you must, you, you never know where it goes to. I had multiple uh, examples for you where uh, the, techni the technological basis they had or the idea they had uh, had uh, five, six curves and the product in the end was a different one. But you must be fast, flexible for the markets. But I would not talk bad about our spin uh, startup situation. We are coming now from Germany. I'm sure you are. But just to be clear, are you referring to the situation or the landscape in all Europe or specifically to Germany? Does this that, apply? Uh, that was specifically Germany. Um, the other European countries are not so much in front also because they have another problem. They have ideas enough, but most of them not money enough. And the uh, spin-off, if you can show me the next slide, please. Uh, the most, one of the very important for a spin-off or a start-up is the binding of technology and capital. The technology is ready in many, um, in uh, many European countries. I would say the all-over situation is, is balanced, is equal. France, Spain, Italy, uh, uh, to mention this, the best in this respect are the Scandinavians. The Norwegians, very good, excellent, and even Finland, the small Finland, I don't know, not even five million inhabitants, they have an excellent uh, basis for spin-off. The financing background, the education background, really, they are really the best in Europe, let's say. Is that okay? Yeah, that's very insightful. Thank you all. So now we move to the last round of questions. And we'll start from Anand. Um, final key message to the, to the audience. And also, I'm sure most of us have ventured founding or, or starting up uh, a company or a startup. So what would be the key message in terms of IT? Of course, so this is the main focus or in general as a, as a recommendation. Yeah. Uh, my suggestion would be for any startup, if uh, they are already started their venture, or uh, planning to start the venture, the most important thing is to look for the first thing which come into mind is the name. By which name I am going to launch my product or uh, it depends on person to person, company to company. So the first important thing is to do a comprehensive research on that. Because once you start your business, once you come into the market, you, you will be going to be known by that brand, by that logo, by that invention. So a comprehensive IP research is the key factor which every startup should look into. Either if trademark is required, patent is required or copyright is required. And along with all these three, the most important is the trade secret, which is... Sorry, this, this is before the launch. This needs to be done. Okay. Correct? Yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, because if we have, if we develop an idea, so first is the uh, how to secure it. So that is the most important. The a very common example is the Coca Cola. The uh, only two persons in the Coca Cola know about the key elements of the Coke. Okay, so we must imagine that what is the level of confidentiality agreement the company must have done with those employees so that that is the only factor if that will come into the market then the company is gone it will it will uh, it will fall flat like class of cards so the most important thing is to secure our ip before starting any idea before going into the market before commercializing and monetizing that would be my suggestion thank you thank you so trademarks and trade secrets and definitely recipes is one of the biggest trade secrets thank you Kelly. Thank you, Anand. Uh, I have two points here. The first one, I would like to recommend a few books for us as IP lawyers that were very, very insightful in my career in general. The first one is called Rembrandt in the Attic. Okay, Rembrandt, the famous painting. And that is a very good book for business IP lawyers, engineers, to show you 
How I PR. That's the first book. The second book is called Edison in the Boardroom, okay, for Thomas Edison. It's not by Thomas Edison, it's just by IP lawyer. Rembrandt in the Attic. Rembrandt in the Attic. A W T I C. Rembrandt, the painter. So that's the first one. The second one is Edison in the Boardroom. And Edison in the Boardroom is about how you commercialize the IP. What are the IP management system? What are the IP strategies that you have to have in place? The third one is simple. It's Einstein in the boardroom, okay? And Einstein in the boardroom is mainly about the I stuff that I referred to first, which is all the non-tangibles other than the IP, okay? And the last one just came out very recent. It's called Burning the Ships by Philip Marshall. Philip Marshall is the chief IP of Microsoft, he wrote a very nice book about licensing of IP. So those four books are really essential, you know, for any IP lawyer, business lawyer, innovative people. The second part, and I will also only focus here, I worked uh, as a general counsel for a fintech uh, not very long ago, and uh, uh, that is a regulated one. And when I first joined, you know, there was not nothing, there was no IP, there was nothing. So it's always good to start with your trade secret policy, okay? Because from your trade secret policy will come out the following important documents. Your NDAs, your non-disclosure agreement that is being used 100 times a day, okay? And instead of relying on other parties, if you have your own NDA, then you are recognized in the market. It's nice. Companies are signing your document. You feel good. You feel confident. So from a trade secret policy, you will have your NDAs. You will have your MOUs for potential business, okay, in order to firm collaboration or exploring cooperation, as they say. And then you will have your employee confidentiality agreement, which is key. In startups, employees come and go so quickly, okay? And how are you going to secure the flow of information? the things that are being exposed to, okay? The stuff that they hear in the coffee room, the stuff that they hear in the elevator, okay? So if you don't have a good confidentiality employee agreement that lists who owns the IP and you orient them, that would be very problematic. And then from the same trade secret policy, you will have your NDA close in any agreement with any customer, okay? So once you have your trade secret policy and those documents are coming out of it, okay, the company start to look like having a personality, an IP personality. This is the first thing, okay? So that's my recommendation. Don't start large, don't start big, just start with a trade secret policy and from the trade secret policy will come out very key documents, including the InfoSec policy, okay? Because it will have an impact how Laptops should be used when I'm using my laptop from a public network. What should happen when I'm using, if my phone is lost, if my laptop is lost, uh, can I leave my badge in a public uh, coffee shop and walk? This is all will come from your trade secret policy and it's very beneficial to everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Lauren? Um, yes. Um, one issue for me is uh, always important, the distance from the idea to spin off, uh, to, to start up, up, to the real entry in the market must be as short as possible. And, this, and the dependencies from IP must be as low as possible. The, the, the importance and the meaning of IP in startups is absolutely overestimated. As my co-speaker said, it is the know-how, it's the trade secrets, it's all the, uh, these things. As most or many uh, startups are coming from technology, from university or from research institutions, those people who want to start up, they must ch change their mentality, they must change their speed at least. They have no time if they start in the seed phase, there is another speed in industry. And if this phase is too long, uh, then you will not survive it as an entrepreneur. You may survive as a researcher if you have 20 years time to develop something. 
in interesting. It will be more interesting than the development of the startup, but uh, the startup needs to earn money as soon as possible. Because my experience is, I saw it multiple times, is that uh, the development is too difficult, too uh, high-tech uh, oriented, costs too much money, the seed phase is too long, the, uh, the investor becomes unpatient, and then it breaks down. It must be streamlined to the target at the market. And uh, remember, if you want to take something into account, that picture I have there, these are eight real important uh, conditions, preconditions to start up successfully. And not one, I did not color it red because it's the most important. I colored it red because this is the topic of the, the other ones are as important as this one. Thanks. May I add one thing for the sake of completeness? So back to trade secret. A lot of companies say, I don't have any trade secret. Okay, let me just give, bring it simple. Your business plan is your trade secret. Your marketing plan is your trade secret. Your sales plan is your trade secret. So those, as long as they are kept secret and you put measures in place to safeguard them, they are trade secrets. And at some point, they can evolve to become a patent. Remember, trade secrets are the crown jewels of the IP. They're the most important, as long as they remain secret. Thank you. Exactly, and you cannot retrieve them. Once they're out, you cannot, there is nothing you can do about it. And definitely, to your point, speed is one of the most critical factors uh, for startups. If I may add a couple of sentences, um, I would add also um, invest in following up on the changing IP lo uh, laws, especially if you're operating on a regional or global level, and uh, to invest in training the team because there are some personal and cultural differences in how we share information or, um, or uh, especially when negotiations. And to your point, I have a story where it, this is real. I was sitting in a cafe and uh, I listened to an entire product launch plan for a company. It wasn't a competitor at the time, but it was really interesting. And now people are working from anywhere, so it's really important. You cannot be everywhere at the same place. Thank you. Uh, how are we doing in time? Can we open uh, the floor for a question? So please introduce yourself and ask uh, the question as uh, clearly as possible. Thank you. There was a question there. Everything is clear? Shall I ask? Please. Uh, uh, one of the things that we notice, you know, it's like, let's say you mentioned about Fraunhofer Institute. When I'm sitting from outside and I'm looking at Germany in general, there's more I hear from, you know, spin-offs and startups from Fraunhofer. Same thing if you think about startups from US, it's Silicon Valley. In India, you know, with all the rankings and everything, heavy concentration in Bangalore. Um, so my point is there's a greater, you know, point being that there is, even within a system, it's almost down to a certain zip code where all these startups are coming from. Um, is, is that a social thing or is, is there something more to that entire, you know, it's like concentration of these startups, any ideas from anyone? Okay, sorry. <clears throat> so raising awareness is key. Uh, uh, last uh, year, um, I've started a nonprofit association in Egypt. It's a part of a global association it's called DEMA, Data Management Association. So well, luckily they've granted me the Egyptian chapter. And the idea is to raise awareness about the importance of data, promote data literacy. And contrary, a lot of people thought that this is targeting, you know, tech startups, government. No, it's actually targeting the basic, the plumbers, the electricians. Uh, the plumber knows a lot about my bedroom and my bathroom than anybody else, okay? And if we don't give him enough education and awareness about the importance of the data that he's collecting, okay, and teach him how to monetize it, okay, it could backfire. So one of the main primary goals of 
the nonprofit association is to educate the simple person on how to protect data and how to monetize data. So raising awareness, okay, particularly in rural areas, okay, outside the concentration you're referring to is key because a lot of them, they would come to the capital, get exposed, go back, and then they feel isolated and then, you know, so you have to have a vibrant and dynamic connection between the capital and the rural area through the awareness part. I hope, thank you. I would also uh, add on this uh, with Indian perspective, as you say that there is a concentration of the area where the startups, yeah, uh, companies are growing. But uh, in India, this perspective has changed rapidly because last year only, the lot of FDI is coming into startups in India. And last year, we set a world record of receiving, receiving FDI in 61 across industries. 61 industries, which is a world record. No country ever received FDI in 61. Uh, and that is, India has around uh, 20, 30 states, 29 states, and we received those uh, uh, funding in 21 states of India. So that uh, concept is rapidly changing that there is only one uh, uh, sector or any one area where the startups or tech are going. So this is my. Uh, thank you for the good discussion. Uh, from the VC point of view, this is one step which we go through when we deal the business model and the startup does the founder has uh, appropriate rights for IP or not. The majority of cases of the early stage and seed stage that they are not because they are uh, uh, deliver the product to the customers. Yeah? Uh, so how do you think what is uh, what can be the solution maybe some platforms which will help the founder uh, to uh, form this uh, fast IP, like or maybe pre-IP documents uh, for the investors, because uh, uh, sometimes on this stage they do not have money for the lawyers uh, to do it proper and right, uh, like it should be done. Um, are there any thoughts how to help founders on the early stages uh, to make us as investors happy? Because if they don't have, it can be the risk yeah, that uh, uh, we will invest money in nothing. And the CTO will go to the other company, competitor. Yeah. Yeah. May I? Yes, it's a, um, a practical question. I like it. Um, the, uh, let's say, uh, the starting point uh, for, for, a, for a startup is to uh, have its idea or its target or whatsoever and to have a partner for it, a strategic partner and a long-time partner. Uh, because otherwise, if you are alone and you are, have only the public programs, there are a lot, of, we have in Germany a lot of programs, startup programs. Uh, they, you have to fill in questionnaires and you have to do whatsoever and then you get 100,000 or 500,000 euro. That's good. But a, a real engaged venture capitalist who knows how to make money finally, um, they know it really. Um, is um, uh, the, the programs are not fast enough, not, not, not streamlined enough uh, on that. And uh, to repeat only what I say, the seed phase is a dangerous phase. You must see the, the, the product. But anyway, the return on invest of spin-off uh, on a technological basis, or basing on IP, is much lower than the than the return on invest, which comes from common uh, companies who are selling customary things, and that's the difference. Uh, the event, the investors know that, and they reduce their expectations already before they invest. And when this reduced expectation uh, will also be not fulfilled, then they don't want any more. So. Again, short time to market and sustainable partnership and not so many programs and supports. I want to keep slim and become big. 
that's my advice i would like to add uh, some something that how to fast track the process and how to gain the trust of the investors because uh, in india we have a system if you are registered as a startup then the most problem the most time taking ip which is the patent that takes more, more three to four years in india but if you are a startup and uh, there is a system that uh, you could pay slightly higher fees so the uh, the period of examination from three to four years would be reduced to one and a half years so in patent uh, we know that until and unless the invention comes to the market we, we cannot commercialize it and it is of no use so by these uh, these uh, methods the government is reducing the time so it is also assisting the startups to allow may I, <clears throat> I would like to add here to this point and to your point uh, the U.S. Patent Office now, they have an accelerated program for tech patents. So instead of spending two years between prior art search, examination, uh, patent prosecution, etc., they have what is called a provisional okay, patent that is granted in less than eight months for a particular technology. So that's from the, and, and you need, you know, patents, at least filing. We don't say you have to have a patent certificate, but at least patent filing in your portfolio when you're raising funds. And to get to that, okay, you need two things within the company. First, the buy-in from the management. So you need to have the CEO and all the A-team, you know, on board to get on something like this, because if you don't have this buy-in, there's no way you're gonna, you know, do a prior art search or, you know, this is number one. Number two, Sometimes you have technology in place that you have developed within the company that you don't think it's a patentable or it's an IP qualifier, okay? For example, your info security policy and the way you are designing your security system, especially if you're in the fintech industry, because it relies a lot on customer data. So you're bringing customer data, you're doing the API, you're doing all the integration, etc and you have a particular technology in place to make that all work. That could be qualifying for IP. So don't disregard it, don't publish it, okay? Make sure you have at least one IP lawyer that comes in and check, you know, whether you have anything that qualifies and you can build on. That's two things, I think. Any other question? Okay, I believe this concludes the panel. Thank you all for the insights and thanks for the organizers, sponsors and hotel team. Thank you. <laughs>